Hello and welcome back. So this is the last lecture of this numerical optimization set of lectures. And the idea is that we will be now talking about con how to solve constraint optimization problems, but not only for equality constraints, but also for inequality constraints. All right, so what's the idea? So again, we remember that we had the unconstrained case where we started at a point here and we got want to get just to an optimal point over here, right? Then when we added constraints, what we wanted to do is find a point in this line that had the maximum objective function back because that means that we are satisfying the equality constraint. Now here I talked about a line and in the past I talked about a hyperplane and so on. This is when you have linear constraints. Again, we're talking in general about non-linear constraints so there could actually be a curve and uh, and so yeah so uh, so just to mention that this doesn't have to be a line because we have non-linear constraints and now what we're going to do is address problems which also have inequality constraints like this one over here so that means that we don't only not only are looking for points inside uh, which satisfy this line, but are also are on the right hand side of this plane, yeah. Um, which means that then they are feasible, yeah. And that means that all of this space over here that is infeasible, yeah. So that means this less than or equal to uh, constraint. All right, so how would we solve it? Well, the first way that we could think about solving this is. Uh, it's what's called a, a barrier method and again this is only one of the ways to solve it there are other methods but this is the one that we'll be talking about throughout this this lecture and what's the main idea well what I want to do is that I can use my standard constrained Newton method that we talked about last time and the way that I'm gonna handle these constraints is I'm gonna append them into the objective function yeah and how am I gonna do this well, I'm going to use some function, which is called CI. And this function CI will, will take as arguments my inequality constraints. And the thing is that if my inequality constraints are satisfied, this CI function will return to me zero. Yeah. So they will not add up or subtract anything to the objective function. Back, yeah. Because again, they're satisfied, so we're happy with them. Now, if this unconstrained uh, inequality constraints are, are satisfied, are not satisfied, then my CA is going to return my token infinity. And because we want to minimize, infinity is the worst objective function value that we're taking into account. Yeah, so it happens that if we're able to solve this problem um, effectively, then we would be solving this problem on the left hand side here. Yeah, because basically all our inequalities would be satisfied if, if our problem is feasible and then we, we're still satisfying our inequality constraints and we're still minimizing our objective function only because all of these are zero. Now as you might imagine this is not very useful in practice because of several reasons. Um, so before that I'm going to do a bit of a change of notation. So just to simplify and not clutter all my slides I'm just going to define that this CI takes some input U, which again, this is just my inequality constraints, but I'm just going to put it for some arbitrary input U. And again, I'm going to see if my input U is less than or equal to zero, this returns a token of zero. If it's greater than zero, then this returns a token of infinity. Yeah. Anyway, so what I just said is in this line over here. Yeah, all that I said is in this line here. And again, what this means is that if a constraint is greater than zero, then the objective function will go to infinity. And because we're trying to minimize, we're going to try to, to avoid this at all costs. Yeah? And so we will satisfy it. Again, if we solve this, it means that we've satisfied it unless our problem is infeasible and we don't have any other choice. Now, the problem of this function, so there are actually several problems, but one of them is that it's not differ differentiable. Another one is that Basically, we don't know how close we are to feasibility, and sometimes that's important. So once you have a solution for the objective, for, for the problem, you, in theory, you don't care how close or far away you are from this line, right? So as long as you're feasible, all your solutions are equally good. 
yeah i mean in general if, if if you if you do care then you should put some something in the objective that tells you that but by design if you're designing your optimization program correctly you don't care how how let's say how feasible you are but when you're trying to find a solution this is i mean you can think of it this is quite a nice property to have to know how close you are or not from feasibility so that then you know which direction you want to go to and so on right and this is one of the disadvantages of this approach again apart from the fact that it's not differential yeah so what what do we do in well something that we do is something that's called a log barrier and basically we're gonna do an approximation of the ca function that i just showed before and the idea is that i'm gonna have here minus my my objective function and i'm gonna put a log here and then I'm going to weight it by 1 over t. And, and what is this going to do? Well, I have to assume that I'm at a feasible point. Yeah. But if I start to a feasible point and an optimizer starts moving this around, what's going to happen is that my inequality constraint, as it goes to zero, so as it approaches infeasibility, then minus my inequality that inside the log term is going to approach minus infinity. And because I have this minus term over here, basically this whole, whole term is going to approach infinity. Yeah. So then you can see that again, it happens what I talked about the CA function. The more I, the, the, the more I approach actually my problem being infeasible, it's going to go to, to, to infinity. But while it's feasible, I also have a measure at least of how, how close I am to violating my constraints. And again, this is quite useful. All right, so what I've just said is this part over here. Yeah, I just wrote it to make space for other things. Now, the nice thing about this is that also for t bigger than, than zero, so you see that here I have also a t, a t parameter. This, so, so my term over here, minus one over t log of minus u is a smooth approximation of my CA function that I showed earlier. And the nice thing about it is that as t goes to infinity, so as this term, you know, gets larger and larger, then this approximation improves. Yeah. So then you can say, okay, then this is very easy. All I have to do is set this t to some very high number, you know, maybe a few millions, and then I solve, solve this problem. And then once I get a solution to this, simply using my constraint Newton method that I just knew, that I just learned about, then I'm actually finding the solution for this problem over here. And the idea is that that is difficult to do in practice because we, we, we run into numerical difficulties. Yeah? But before I talk more about that, I want to show uh, just how pic in a picture how this looks like. So my CA function is this dotted line over here where again, it gives me a penalty of absolutely zero all the way until I reach zero, and then it gives me a penalty of infinity. Yeah. On the other hand, this minus one over t times log of minus u gives me these smooth curves. And the idea is that the closer these curves are of my CA, of my dotted line, they are for higher uh, values for t. Yeah. So again, the idea is that these are smooth approximations and the higher the, 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 the value of t is as t goes to infinity, the better the approximation becomes. And again, the thing here is that I would be just tempted to, to, to send t to infinity. And then just solve it via my KKT equality constraint method that I just learned about. Yeah. But then, as I just mentioned, this is numerically very unstable. Yeah, And if I'm writing some uh, some commercial code, right? I can't have my algorithm just sometimes working and sometimes not. Um, so, 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 so this is not this is not a good way to do it. Yeah. So, how how do we get around that problem? Well, one way to do it, and again, this is what's called the barrier method. Uh, sorry, the, the yeah, the barrier method, and it follows the central path. Is the idea that you start with some small value of t. Yeah. So what you do is you would solve this problem for some small value of t. And again, you don't run into numerical difficulties because your value of t is small. Then at the end, you get some final solution. You have some final solution x star. 
and then you increase your t a bit but now your new starting point is the optimal solution from your past value from when t was smaller yeah so you do something like look, looks like this image so you might start here and for a small value of t you go all the way here yeah and then you crank up t yeah so you make t a bit larger and then you start from this point over here and then go to this second line and then you again increase t and you start from this point and you go on and on and on all the way until you reach very close to the constraint yeah notice that you will never actually touch the constraint because again if not this value goes to this whole value goes to infinity but you will get very very close and actually we'll see that a nice thing about this method because is that you can predefine how close you want to be to the constraint yeah and this is for example I mean, vaguely speaking, this is how, for example, IPOPT works. So if you see generally, they satisfy constraints, inequality constraints with very high precision, something to e to the minus 16 uh, or e to the minus 15, depending actually on your, your machine precision, but uh, you, you can get very, very close, even though you're not touching it. Now, so the algorithm would go something like this. So you start from some strictly feasible point. So again, you have to be strictly feasible. And you start some, with some x0. You have to predefine some t0. Again, this should be some not so big value. Yeah. You define predefine some alpha. In this case, alpha is by how much you're gonna increase t at every iteration, and some epsilon. And this epsilon is how close you wanna get to your inequalities. Okay, so the nice thing is that again you you can predefine how many iterations you're gonna go because depending on how close you want how how aggressive you want to update t and how large you want t to become you can actually know how close you will be to the true inequality yeah so what you would do is you would solve this problem yeah so that's what i mean so this is problem the barrier method problem for for some value of tk starting at some xk and then you would get some optimum value xk star and that's going to be your your starting value for the next iteration and again at the same time what you're going to do is you're going to increase your tk value by a little bit yeah and so in this way what you will do is actually by repeatedly solving uh constraint newton by newton by constraint newton method your problem then you will actually be solving this problem with inequality constraints yeah and this is roughly speaking this is how many uh, commercial codes work yeah this is what's called interior point methods so the tk key takeaways of this is that one way to solve inequality constraint problems it's to add the constraint with a log barrier or log penalty to the objective function yeah and then the object the, the 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 penalty would be added something that looks like this that again is your objective function minus this t parameter and then the sum of your of your inequalities the 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 thing is that the approximation improves as t goes to infinity and then you can solve this repeatedly via kkt equality constraint by increasing t yeah because t for initially a very high value it becomes numerically unstable now something that I must say here is that methods do not actually, so methods that I'm using practice do not actually do this, this loop. What they do, roughly speaking, is they actually, this t parameter here, they include it as a multiplier. So it, it has the interpretation actually of a multiplier for inequality constraints. And I mean, obviously there's some smart uh, routines and, and tricks that go around it. If you're interested on exactly how this is done, you could look at Stephen Boyd's book on convex optimization, its last chapter, or also Stephen Wright has a full book on interior point methods and he tells you exactly how, how this works in practice. But again, this is a big picture idea and if you if, if you code uh, your own little, little algorithm with this, it, it would work, I mean, quite well for, for just not super difficult problems yeah and so with this uh this is the end of the numerical optimization mini course where again the idea here was to present some key ways to solve 
problems in continuous numerical optimization. And again, although each of these lectures actually might comprise a whole, a whole course, here we, we, we condense them into probably 15 to 20 minute videos. But I think it gives you enough of an idea to be able to, if you want, go and code them and start experimenting them, either reading more. Again, some key, some key references are, of course, uh, Boyd's numerical optimization. Uh, I mentioned also Stephen Wright's for the for the interior point, and also Nosedal and Wright, which is, a, I think, one a very good good book for this uh, continuous numerical optimization. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is it for now. Thank you.